Hello, Hull Champions. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 lies about belly fat that people still believe. And why is it so critically important that we understand this? Because belly fat isn't just a nuisance. It can even be a matter of life and death. And with all the myths and lies and misconceptions floating around, how are you going to solve the problem if you don't understand how it works? How, who are you going to trust if you don't know how it works. And first of all, there's two kinds of belly fat. There's subcutaneous and there's visceral. And there's a difference in terms of health aspect here. So we have a muscle, first of all, and then we have outside of the muscle, we have some fat. And then Outside of the fat, we have some skin. So subcutaneous simply means under the skin. So it's between the skin and the muscle. But then the one we're really concerned with is the intra-abdominal. That's inside the muscle. And it's also known as visceral fat. And why do we care more about visceral fat? Because it is associated with metabolic disease. It's caused by metabolic disease. And we're finding out more and more that virtually all chronic degenerative disease, such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and stroke and even cancer, is caused by metabolic disease. Which means that if you have a bunch of this belly fat, the intra-abdominal or visceral belly fat, then you may be a candidate, you may be at higher risk. So belly fat is not the only thing that causes cancer and heart disease and so forth, but it is a common factor. And the first lie is that thin people are safe. We believe as a culture that if you're skinny, you got nothing to worry about. Thin is healthy. And yes, very often, thin people are healthier than overweight people, but it's not that clear cut. So even thin people can be relatively fat. There's something called skinny fat. So when you're wearing clothes and on the outside, you look relatively lean, but you still have quite a bit of body fat. And even if you have a fair amount of muscle, you still could have something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease which means that you are starting to get metabolic disease. You have fatty infiltration of the liver. And it used to be that the only thing that could cause that was alcohol. But today, by far, the most common cause is sugar and specifically fructose. And a lot of these people will have type 2 diabetes or be on their way to type 2 diabetes even though they look relatively thin. They might have just the tiniest little pot belly beginning that you don't even really think about when they're wearing clothes, but this would not be a healthy person. Line number two is that belly fat is inevitable with age, that once you reach a certain age, 50 or 60, then you just have to have it. And maybe you've been told by a doctor or by a well-meaning relative that, hey, don't worry about it. You've just reached that age. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, inevitable is not the same as that it tends to increase with age. It's just much more common and therefore we believe that that's the way it has to be, but it's not so. All that means is that the bad stuff people do to get belly fat, the older you get, the more time you've had to do bad stuff. And then eventually your barriers sort of break down. Your body has a certain resistance and a certain capacity to handle things, but if you do something long enough, finally the dam breaks. And I have a part 2B on this also, because a lot of people also believe that when you do have the belly fat and you're older, then it's impossible to turn it around. It's irreversible. You're stuck with it. And again, that's a myth. That's a lie because everything is an adaptation. You've done certain things for a long time and the body adapts to it. But if you reverse the things that you did and you take certain action, then you can reverse that adaptation as well. Line number three is a calorie is a calorie. And if you believe that, then you also believe that all belly fat and all weight gain is just 
overeating, that it's just that simple. You just have to eat less and exercise more and you're going to take care of the problem. And these people really have no understanding about what's happening in the body when they say things like that. So let's just compare if you eat 500 calories of jelly beans versus if you eat 500 calories of chicken wings. And just look at some of the very, very basic mechanisms here. So this is your blood sugar and your body needs to maintain a certain level of blood sugar for you to feel good, to fuel the brain and certain metabolic processes. And if it gets too high or if it gets too low, that's very dangerous. You can get into a coma if it's high or low. So the body really wants to keep it in there. But what happens if you eat 500 calories of jelly beans, now your blood sugar is going to do that. And then your body is going to release some insulin to bring it back down. That's a hormone that takes care of blood sugar. And because you release so much insulin to respond to that huge blood sugar spike, it's going to come down crashing very, very quickly. And very often it's going to overshoot a little bit. So now you have what's called hypoglycemia. And when you have hypoglycemia, it's really important for the body to bring it back up. So first of all, your body releases cortisol, which is a stress hormone to raise blood sugar. So this is very stressful and unnatural to the body, first of all. But then what happens? You ate 500 calories and it can't stay in the bloodstream. So the body has to take care of it very, very quickly. So it forces it into the cell, but the cell says, hey, I've got all I can handle. I'm already full from your previous meal. Now what's going to happen is this gets converted to fat. That's the second job of insulin. And so you eat 500 calories, you use a little bit, maybe 100 calories during this time period, but 400 or so gets stored and or turned into fat. And what happens then is now you're super hungry because your blood sugar is low and you have stored away everything as fat and with high insulin you can't get to it. So first of all, the jelly beans causes these calories to be stored and converted as fat. Secondly, they make you more hungry. So let's compare that and contrast with what would happen if you ate 500 calories of chicken wings. Chicken wings have no sugar, they have mostly fat and protein. They don't raise blood sugar, they don't trigger insulin. So now instead, you are going to have an extremely slow and moderate rise in blood sugar and then it's going to come down and it's not going to crash down and overshoot. So one more thing that happens here is here you're going to have the spike very, very early on. With the chicken wings, it's going to be not a spike. It's just going to be like a slight elevation and it's going to come much later. So when you eat the chicken wings or if it's a meat patty with some lettuce or whether it's sardines or something that just doesn't have a bunch of sugar but it's higher in fat and protein. Now it's broken down and absorbed so much slower that you're not going to store hardly any of it because you're going to use it at the same slow pace that it's being released and absorbed. So when people say a calorie is a calorie, they really don't know what they're talking about. And in addition to what we just talked about, there's also differences. There are genetic factors. There are stress and lack of sleep. Lack of sleep is a form of stress. And all of these things will affect your hormones and hormones will change your behavior. Hormones will change what happens to the food. It will change your behavior in terms of hunger and when you go and eat next. And the fourth lie is that eating fat leads to belly fat. People believe that whatever you see on the body must have come from that same thing. So there's this saying, you are what you eat, right? I'm sure you've heard that. 
And it's one of those that if you hear it enough times, then it becomes true. Just because it's a saying and we've heard it so many times, then there is no disputing it. But I have a little bit of problem with that. So then if you are what you eat, then how can this grass turn into that? When a cow, how can a cow eat grass and turn something into something that is full of saturated fat and cholesterol because there's no cholesterol in grass and there's virtually no fat. So what happens is that it's the bacteria in the cow's gut, in the rumen, that can break these down and turn them into fatty acids and amino acids that become the tissue of the cow and that becomes the steak. So the point being, if the cow has a bunch of saturated fat and it didn't come from saturated fat, then maybe the fat on your body doesn't come from fat either. And that's exactly how it works. It's a conversion. It's a biotransformation. And again, it's the insulin that we just talked about. The insulin is the thing that converts things to fat and that stores the fat. Another interesting thing that most people don't realize is that there is about 50% saturated fatty acids in beef fat, but there is over 40%, about 42% of monounsaturated fatty acids. And that's the good stuff. That's the one everyone agrees that the monounsaturated, also known as oleic acid or olive oil, is super healthy that's like the best fat and almost half of the fat in the steak is actually the same fat as an olive oil which interestingly is a higher percentage than most vegetable oils sold so soybean oil for example is only like 20 30 percent monounsaturated fatty acids and also very interestingly is that humans store approximately the same ratio not exactly the same it's going to vary a little bit but pretty much along those lines is the type of fat that we have in the body as well and guess what it doesn't matter if you're a vegan or if you're a carnivore or if you're a frugivore who only eat fruit the fat on your body and you all have some is going to be approximately something along those ratios. And that's just the way that mammals store fat. It's just the most convenient and the most efficient way to store extra energy on the body. So next time someone tells you that eating fat causes belly fat, remember that it's the insulin that causes the storage of fat. And insulin is triggered by things that raise blood sugar and Dietary fat does not raise blood sugar. It's negligible, if any, and therefore the insulin response is also negligible. On the flip side of that is the lie that the best way to get rid of belly fat is to eat low fat and no fat foods. And I don't have a problem with things like lettuce and non-starchy vegetables, which are very low in carbohydrate. They virtually no impact on blood sugar but they're also very low fat those are still perfectly fine what I'm talking about are foods that are normally high in fat but we have produced low fat versions so we're talking about low fat milk low fat cheese and cream cheese alternatives low fat yogurt low fat sour cream low fat salad dressings low fat peanut butter because here's what you have to think about. If these things normally have a lot of fat, and that's why we like them, by the way, that's why they're so delicious and so creamy and so yummy and satisfying. And now they take out the main thing that gives these foods their character. What's left? Well, not very much. So first they process them and ruin them and take out the valuable thing. But now the food is incredibly boring and they have to add something to make it tasty and have the right mouthfeel and so forth. So now you start with a worthless food and then you add things like sugar and artificial flavor and thickening agents and emulsifiers and mono and diglycerides and 
polydextrose and MSG. So what you're getting really is a chemical concoction that is mixed in with this destroyed food. And now it's going to happen because it's not satisfying at all. The way the original food was full of fat and had very, very satiating effect. Now it doesn't satisfy, but instead they've added a bunch of sugar. So now you spike your blood sugar and it makes you eat more of this useless, tasteless food. So do yourself a favor and just eat the original version the way nature intended it. But then we can take this carb thing too far also. And I've done a lot of videos where I talk about how carbohydrates are not essential. You can live perfectly fine without them. There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. But it also doesn't mean that carbohydrates are evil in every form and that zero is always better than a little bit. But it also doesn't mean that we want to trust the mainstream recommendations and eat 65% of our calories as carbohydrates, primarily from grain, fruits, and vegetables. We need to understand what the difference is between these because they're all carbohydrates. So what is the difference and what makes a bad carbohydrate? Well, bad carbohydrates, they spike blood sugar, they change how you feel, they have drug-like effects, they make you hungrier, they're comfort foods. You eat them for the purpose of changing how you feel. Many of them contain sugar, which has fructose, they're heavily processed, and as a result, these foods make you hungry. These are bad carbohydrates. So which ones of these will do that? Well, grains is definitely gonna spike blood sugar. Most bread sold also has sugar added, which means it contains fructose, and therefore both sugar and wheat actually has the capacity to change how you feel. They can fit into opiate receptors in the brain and create drug-like effects. So there are differences. There are breads that are not as bad as others, but overall we want to avoid grains. If you have belly fat and you're trying to get rid of it, then grain is not your friend. And then we have fruits, and I put a question mark on that because it's going to depend on the person and it's going to depend on what type of fruit. So if you have belly fat or diabetes and you're trying to get rid of it, then I would avoid all fruit except some berries. Blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries are fine a little bit here and there. If you are happy with your amount of belly fat, then you can probably have a couple of fruits per day and it's not going to mess anything up. But don't buy into the slogan of eating more fruits and vegetables, more fruits and vegetables, as if more was always better. It's better than some junk food, but it doesn't mean that you get healthier the more fruit you eat. You can tolerate some, but everything that you want to get from fruits, all those plant factors, you can get from vegetables. And the good vegetables are things like non-starchy vegetables and leafy greens. Non-starchy would be things like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, etc. And those vegetables get a big green check mark because they don't do any of the things that the bad carbs do. And I know that there are some carnivores who feel that zero carbohydrate is better than a few grams, but it doesn't work like that because protein will stimulate more insulin and more blood sugar than these non-starchy vegetables will do. In fact, they might have one or two or three grams of sugar, but it is so tightly embedded into the cellular structure that you probably won't even ever get to absorb it. You probably chew it and swallow and it goes through your digestive tract and it gets picked up uh, along the way. You absorb some, but a lot of it gets left for your gut bacteria. And that's the biggest reason why you want to eat some vegetables that they have stuff that your gut bacteria need. Line number seven is that if you want to lose belly fat, then you're going to have to get used to eating a lot of really boring foods. So a lot of diets have things like rice cakes and sawdust muffins. Have you ever had one of those? 
where you take a bite and your mouth gets so dry that you need a whole pitcher of water just to choke the darn thing down and afterwards you wonder why you even ate it in the first place because it tasted so boring and then we have things like skinless chicken breast with dry rice but you can relax because not only do you not have to eat that type of food that type of food is not even really that good to lose belly fat because a lot of it has carbohydrates so instead you want to eat real food you want to eat things like steak and fish and chicken you want to eat full fat eggs cheese and sour cream you want to eat the yolk with the eggs and you can eat as much non-starchy vegetables as you like. You can put some butter on them. You can steam them. You can put them, bake them in the oven. You can eat nuts and seeds and you can have natural whole fats like butter, olive oil and coconut oil, which are mostly saturated or monounsaturated and therefore are very shelf stable and they won't cause oxidative stress or inflammation in your body. And then you can make rich, creamy sauces and eat that with your steak and your vegetables. And it's going to take a little while before you get used to this type of food, but it is so delicious and so rewarding. Every meal becomes a gourmet meal after a while. And what you find is because these foods are more concentrated and because you don't spike your blood sugar, you will not get as hungry, you will not eat as many meals. Once you start eating this way, you'll find that eating once or twice a day becomes much more natural than eating a little bit all the time. And number eight is that if you want to lose belly fat, then the vegan diet would be the best because a lot of people have had success with that. But believe it or not, there is the opposite of vegan, which is the carnivore diet, which has also helped a tremendous number of people. So what we need to understand is it depends on the person and it's not really about which camp you decide to be in. It's about can you eat under these diets and eat satiating food? And yes, you absolutely can. Can you eat foods in a way that stabilize your blood sugar? Yes, absolutely can. And can you eat these types of foods and eat whole food as opposed to processed foods? Yes, definitely. So there are good reasons why you might want to try a vegan or a carnivore, but I believe that it is better in the long run to eat a variety of foods. And one reason to not eat vegan forever would be that a lot of vegan, not all of them, but a lot of them develop various deficiencies over time. And one reason that you wouldn't want to do carnivore forever is that a lot of health has been associated with gut bacteria. They've found that the healthiest people have the widest diversity of gut bacteria. And when you eat carnivore, you're not really feeding those gut bacteria much at all. So like I said, I think there are good reasons to try either one, but I don't believe you should be on it forever. So try it for 30 to 90 days. Notice what the effects are. See how you feel. But even if you feel the best you've ever felt, which a lot of people will report both on vegan and carnivore, I don't think that you want to stay on it forever. I think that you should try to introduce a range of foods after that time period. And then we get to the exercise lies. And number nine says that if you want to lose belly fat, then you have to do a lot of crunches. You have to do a lot of abdominal exercises. And I'm sure you've seen that there's a lot of videos on belly fat and about half of them are on diet and the other half are on doing crunches pretty much. But if you think that crunches is going to do the job, if that's the main way, then you also believe in a religion called spot reduction. And that religion says that if you exercise a muscle, then you will also burn the fat on top of that muscle. And that is completely false. There is no vascular connection. There is no way for that muscle to affect 
that fat or for that fat to burn because you're using that muscle. It just doesn't work like that. And the other type of exercise that's often promoted is cardio, that you need to do long, long sessions of cardio, whether it's running or whether it's doing spin classes or aerobics or something like that. But let's look at what exercise actually does. Is it of any benefit? An exercise can assist a little bit, but it's not the main thing. So it can work to the extent that it uses up some glucose. And if you use up the glucose, the muscles will basically suck up the glucose without needing insulin or without needing as much insulin. And then because there's less insulin released, there's going to be less tendency for fat storage. You're assisting your body toward insulin sensitivity a smidgen. But that intense exercise also needs to not increase hunger. And what happens to a lot of people when they exercise intensely, their body starts craving carbohydrate because they used it all up because there was such high level and now they get more cravings and more appetite and they kind of shoot themselves in the foot. So what you instead want to do is you want to realize that simple things like walking will actually burn fat directly. You still have an energy expenditure that you can sustain for a longer period of time without causing stress hormones or increasing carbohydrate or sugar cravings. Another great thing to do is weightlifting because if you push yourself a little bit with weightlifting then you will make a whole lot more growth hormone both to make muscle but also to burn fat probably also not increasing appetite as much as you would with cardio. And another form of training is HIT or high intensity interval trainings. And again, some people confuse cardio and HIT and they think you can do cardio for 45 minutes and call it HIT if you have intense periods in there. That's not HIT. HIT is very, very short term, high intensity. You can do something for 30 seconds to a minute and you can repeat that three, four, five times. But the whole point is just to get your heart rate up really, really high. Or you can do HIT with weightlifting if you do a few sets to maximum capacity where you basically fail during that set, during that weightlift attempt. Now you're also pushing the body to make extra growth hormone. And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of exercise. Exercise is absolutely necessary. It's not optional. It will improve the function of every physiological process in your body. You cannot have optimal health. You cannot express optimal physiology without exercise, but it's not going to be the main thing to help you lose belly fat. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.